Good afternoon. Um, I'm Robert Dijkraaf, Director and Leon Levy Professor at the Institute for Advanced Study, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to a lecture that's in many ways a first. First of all, it's the first of the series of public lectures that the Institute hosts uh, through the years, and it will feature professors from each of the Institute's four schools, which then will, they will address issues relevant to the research explored here on campus. But more important, it's the first public talk by Danny Roderick, the Albert O. Hirschman Professor in the Institute School of Social Science, who is our most recent newcomer. And we are very happy to, uh, to, to have welcomed you, Danny, and your wife, Pinar, and son, Denise, here to the Institute community. Uh, Danny joined us uh, from uh, Harvard University, where he was on the faculty of the John F. Kennedy School of Government. And then he's a leading political economist who has transformed understanding of international development, globalization, and economic policies. His work bridges theory and public policy, combining rigorous research with ideas across the field of economics, including the consequences of globalization, the role of national institutions, the challenges of inequality, and the tensions between the market and the state. And some of you must have seen that his work actually was quite frequently mentioned last few months where people were again discussing the fate of emerging countries and from various perspectives. Then he was born in Istanbul and holds a PhD in economics, an MPA from Princeton University and an AB summa cum laude from Harvard University. Then he was selected for the institute appointment for many reasons, but not the least of his, he's one of the most distinguished economists worldwide. And he's deeply involved in a dialogue between the disciplines. And these characteristics make him a dynamic addition to the school, and I would say a fitting successor to Albert Hersman, one of the school's founders who sadly, sadly passed away last year. And we had such a wonderful memorial session for that. To uh, quote uh, Joseph Stieglitz, a uh, Nobel laureate in economics, he has described Danny as having broken the mold of a conventional economist. And he has noted that the economics field has progress, subs progressively subscribed to the ideas and modes of analysis that he helped pioneer. Then he was awarded many different prizes, but I should mention that in 2007 he was awarded the inaugural Albert O. Hirschman Prize of the Social Science Research Council. His current research centers on the future of economic growth and the role of ideas in politi political economy. And as you will hear, he maintains that successful institutional design is a customizable, underpinned by effective basic principles, but flexible in implementation. One of today's most publicized and uh, cited economists, he's the author of several books that have challenged orthodoxy and yet have become standard texts in his field. His most recent book, The Globalization Paradox, published in 2011, has been translated in 12 languages. And his 1997 book, Has Globalization Gone Too Far?, has been called one of the most important economic books of the decade. His monthly columns appear in publications worldwide, and he also maintains a personal blog. And I'll just cite one blog item, which was uh, in June, and it was titled Goodbye Harvard, Hello Institute for Advanced Study. <laughs> and he reflected on this very difficult choice that you have made, uh, that we're all so grateful for, explaining that it, quote, wasn't just simply the honor of assuming a chair named after Albert Hirschman, filled previously by a scholar no less distinguished than Eric Maskin, or the singular privilege of having no responsibilities other than research, but rather the thought that moving to the IES would free him, me, up for a new, if at the moment, quite unpredictable intellectual journey, infused with an added element of uncertainty and flux. And you make sure, you can be made sure that I will use that quote at many different occasions. But <laughs> very difficult to put what the Institute is and its mission in, in a better way. So tonight we are privileged uh, not only uh, to, to welcome here, but to hear some of the beginnings, what I hope will be a new uh, element in that wonderful journey thus far. Uh, as is custom here, at the end of the lecture, there will be some time for questions and answers. But now, I please, I hope you will join me in welcoming Danny Roderick to the stage, and he will give a talk, as you can see, titled The Past, Present, a very important future of economic convergence. Ladies and gentlemen, Danny Roderick.
Thank you very much, uh, Robert, uh, for um, that, that introduction. Uh, as, as Robert mentioned, this is my, my first lecture here, and, uh, um, and I, I do want to begin by, by thanking uh, uh, the, the Institute, starting, of course, uh, by, by Robert for uh, having given me this, this opportunity, the, the welcome uh, and the hospitality that, that uh, uh, we have received, uh, we have encountered as a family uh, upon coming here has been, has been simply immense. Um, so um, I, I do want to thank you, Robert, uh, uh, the, um, uh, my colleagues at the, uh, the School of Social Science, uh, the staff, uh, everybody uh, for having uh, both made this possible and for having made our transition so smooth and, and, and so enjoyable. So it's, it's a true privilege uh, to be here and to occupy the particular uh, chair that, that, that I do. Um, so um, I, the most that I can say is I'll try not to um, embarrass the Institute too much. Um, the, uh, the, the, the topic, um, the subject of my uh, talk is uh, convergence, uh, economic convergence. Um, and uh, the main question I'm addressing is, uh, the disparities around the world, uh, the economic disparities and the, uh, and the prospect and the likelihood that those disparities might shrink, might uh, be reduced uh, in a significant way uh, in the years ahead. Uh, just to give you a sense of, of the disparities uh, that, that I'm talking about, uh, this is um, the way that the World Bank uh, carves up uh, the world uh, into different groups of countries at different levels of income, the way from uh, countries in the, the high income uh, range to the low income, so then in, in, in between there's a lower middle income, upper middle income, and this is the world average. Um, and I've put down there sort of the, the number of people in each one of these uh, uh, country groups and also sort of a representative country so you can, you can, you can uh, um, have a conc more concrete sense of uh, which countries belong in, in what groups. There's about um, three dozen countries uh, in this low income group, uh, about 800 million people, most of them, uh, all, but not all, uh, from sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and the, the disparities here, of course, are huge. You can see the income difference, and I should mention that all the income uh, figures that I'm going to be using are adjusted for purchasing power parity. So that is that, that is basically in principle, uh, they adjust for the fact that uh, a dollar converted at the current exchange rate in different countries actually can buy very different baskets of goods and commodities. So that's, there's an adjustment for that. And so these, these uh, dollar figures are meaningful in that way in terms of what purchasing power they afford. Uh, there's a d d difference of, of, of more than 25 fold uh, between the countries in the low income group and the countries in the high income group. And of course, that's, uh, if you go, um, you know, look, uh, disaggregate the, this further, you'll get, of course, discrep discrepancies that are uh, much, much, uh, much bigger. Uh, so these are the, the basic discrepancies uh, at the level of, of individual countries. I'll also, also talk about discrepancies at the level of individuals and, in fact, how these two relate to each other. But basically, this is the bad news. Uh, the world is a deeply uh, unequal place. Um, the good news uh, is that there has been actually real change uh, over the last uh, two decades. Um, this is a, a, a chart uh, that summarizes the growth experience of uh, two different groups of countries since 1950, uh, all the way uh, to the present. Uh, so basically, I've divided here the world into um, two groups, developed countries, that's basically North America, uh, Western Europe, and Japan, and the rest, uh, which I call emerging markets and developing, and just chart, and, and the graph shows what the, uh, the, the yearly growth rates of these different countries are. So these are the vertical axis is the growth rate of GDP per capita, of, of income per head. Um, and what you can see here is then, of course, and then to smooth this, I just basically, you should do, you just focus on the orange and the green lines. The orange one is the, uh, is the developing countries, the green one is the, is the advanced countries. And what has been happening since the early 1990s is something that's very, very interesting and very encouraging from the perspective of reducing these disparities, which is that developing countries are now growing uh, much more rapidly than the rich countries. 
Now, that wasn't always the case. As you can see, in fact, throughout much of the post-war period, the reverse was true. And I'll talk about that in a broad historical um, uh, context in, in a little while. Uh, but that this gap has now opened up uh, to something like five percentage points, a huge gap. Um, uh, and, and I should add that, that, that the reason that this gap keeps on increasing uh, is, the, is, is by and large the result of two things. One is that China, a huge country, is growing extremely rapidly. And secondly, because it's growing so rapidly, it's becoming a larger part of the aggregate and therefore it's pushing up the, 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 the average. So it's not that actually the growth rate of individual developing countries has been increasing. It's a comp there's a compositional effect going on here. Nonetheless, this is uh, extremely uh, uh, interesting and encouraging, as suggesting that some of those disparities might actually be uh, 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 going down, that there might be significant economic convergence happening uh, if we can be reasonably certain that this is going to continue. So that's one of the big questions. Uh, will this actually continue? There are reasons to be skeptical, uh, so I want to just lay those out as, a, as, as by way of, of background. Uh, to motivate uh, what I'm going to be talking about next. But before I do that, there's another interesting chart which actually looks at, at, uh, at global income distribution at the level of individuals. Of course, this is, an, uh, this is as best as we can figure it out, right? Uh, but what you can see here is that just in the uh, process of this last two decades of developing countries growing more rapidly than the advanced countries, uh, what we have had is that not only the global distribution of income has shifted, of course, to the right as a, as a fact, as a, as a result of growth, but that the shape of the global distribution of income, and remember now, this is not just on the basis of countries, this is our best guess of what the interpersonal distribution of income at the global level looks like, um, that that global distribution has, is now becoming, starting to look more normal as opposed to 1988, uh, where in fact it was bimodal. So the global distribution in the 1988 was really sort of like, you know, a bunch of people that are poor uh, over there and a bunch of sort of richer people here. Those are the two humps in that distribution. Uh, you look at that same distribution more recently, the middle part has filled out. There's sort of like a, you can actually talk about a global middle class. So if you ask who are this global middle class? There are the hundred, hundreds of millions uh, of, of Chinese and, and Indians uh, in, in, the rest, in the last couple of decades that have actually significantly um, uh, become uh, better off uh, if, if not completely enriched. Um, so this is the, 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 the good news. Um, now, is this going to continue? Well, uh, we have to examine this evidence in the context of the fact that the last two decades have always also been very, very special in terms of the global economic context. Uh, high commodity prices, there's a, commodity prices have been very high and most developing countries are commodity exporters. So when commodity prices are high, uh, that they tend to experience increases in income and therefore growth. Uh, interest rates globally have been very low and because a lot of developing countries actually borrow a lot on global financial markets and because they have been able to access lots of foreign capital, you can also get lots of artificial growth that's actually sort of uh, driven uh, by the availability of cheap foreign finance and some not too dissimilar to the kind of the expansion uh, of, of the financial system we had in the subprime lending boom, and, uh, but now think of that at the level of countries. And there are also reasons to believe that there is something very exceptional about China in this period, both in terms of what China was able to do, as well as what it, it was allowed to do by the rest of the world in the sense that China basically played the whole globalization game uh, according to its own rules and essentially uh, was a free rider uh, on the rest of the world economy in, in significant ways. And that was okay as long as China wasn't uh, you know, really a big part of the world economy. But there are reasons to believe that, that, that I might come back to at the very end that both China might not be able to continue the kind of export-led growth that it was able to do as well as the rest of the world might be much more hostile to the kind of strategy, economic development strategy that, that it pursued. Uh, so for all of these combinations of reasons, the future is unlikely to look like the recent past and therefore sort of, you know, uh, we need to have a better understanding of what the drivers of convergence of economic growth are. Um, so I'm going to be um, 
doing uh, this, uh, trying to understand uh, by trying to provide answers uh, through three questions. I'm not going to spend equal amounts of time on all three, probably the least on, uh, amount on the third. Uh, but the first question actually I want to start off with um, is to try to convince you that methodologically dealing with countries as units makes sense. That is, if we're you know, interested in disparities and economic convergence, that looking at differences across countries and therefore looking at experience of growth at the level of countries actually is a sensible thing to do as opposed to looking at individuals. You can, there, there are you know, poor people in all countries, why don't we focus directly on poor people as opposed to poor countries? So I want to convince you that I'm looking at poor countries uh, is, 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 is important and is, 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 uh, is, is a good way of, of entering this discussion. Then I want to spend some time on, on basically um, a little bit of, of, of empirics, a little bit of, 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 of uh, um, conceptual background to understand some of the mechanics, uh, and that will allow me to say something about uh, future prospects. So let me, let me start uh, with this uh, question. Why? Um, focus on countries as opposed to, uh, to people. So I'm going to, 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 to try to um, uh, motivate this uh, by testing your intuition about the, um, the, deter the determinants of global inequality. Um, how much of global inequality is driven by inequality within countries as opposed to how much of it is driven by inequality across countries or between countries. So I'm going to be asking you to think about the answer to a specific uh, question, okay? So this will be a quiz, uh, but you don't have to worry about getting the answer wrong. Um, and the question that I want you to um, answer uh, is, would you rather be rich in a poor country or poor in a rich country, okay? Now, um, I need to define some terms Okay, so that we can actually get at uh, the, the part of this question uh, that, that is relevant uh, to, uh, to my argument. So uh, I'm going to ask you uh, to care only about your own income and purchasing power, okay? So you know, we know about relative deprivation and all of that and sort of the various things about living in unequal society. So I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not, uh, underplaying, I don't want to downplay the importance of those things, but those are for my purposes irrelevant. So I just want you to consider as answering the question only uh, with respect to your own income and purchasing power, okay? So the next thing I have to do is define what I mean by rich and poor, okay? So I'm going to be defining rich and poor within a country as follows. So the rich will refer to the top 5%, okay? So, um, uh, so a rich person is going to have the same income level as the representative person in the top ventile or the top first 5% of a country's income distribution. Why, is, why five? Well, because that's sort of, you know, you know the smallest you know, slice of top incomes, which we have data, so which I can talk about, okay? Uh, poor, similarly, is going to be somebody who has the same income level as people in the bottom 5% of a country's income distribution. And I define rich and poor country completely analogously, which is to say that if I take all countries and rank them according to average per capita income, right, uh, a poor country is going to be sort of a country in the middle of the bottom 5% of that ranking, and a, and a country that is rich is going to be in the middle of the top 5% of that ranking. Okay? So with that, uh, I think I've given you uh, all the information, all the terms of this question. And so I'm going to ask you to um, answer the quiz. So how many of you would rather be rich in a poor country? Okay. How many would rather be poor in a rich country? Okay, so it's, it's you know, you, you've done actually really well. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> I, I, you know, it's, it's half and half, and maybe, in fact, um, there's a slight um, uh, pluralist or slight uh, majority of you who might have preferred, um, uh, you know, being, you know, being poor in a, in a, in a rich country. Now, uh, the answer, which we can actually calculate, is that it's not even close, okay? Uh, that a rich person, 
uh, in, a, in a poor person in a rich country is more than four times better off uh, than a rich person uh, in a poor country, given the terms that I've decided. Okay? Now, those of you who answered wrong, the, one, the group that raised their hands first, should not at all be embarrassed. Uh, I've asked this question in audiences where there are some of the best development economists uh, in the country, uh, in the world, and many of them have gotten the answer to this question wrong as well. Now, uh, this is, what is this actually saying? Uh, what this is saying uh, is that if you want to understand the patterns of global inequality, in fact, most of that inequality is created by differences across countries. That as unequal as individual countries might be, it's nowhere near as unequal as the spread of income across averages of countries. So another way of saying that is to say, suppose I look at the overall global inequality, once again, the interpersonal global inequality, okay? Now, uh, some of you may want to ask me how, in fact, uh, Bourguignon and Morrison ar arrived at the interpersonal distribution of global income back in 1820. Uh, but they did their best, and that's the best estimate that we have. There's no reason to believe that at least the trend here uh, has been badly, um, uh, 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 badly um, uh, um, uh, missed. But basically, you know, the world has become a much more unequal place uh, since the 19th century. Um, and if we ask the question, well, uh, what accounts for this? Let's just divide this up into uh, the part of inequality which is due to inequality in, within countries and the part that is due to between countries, right? It turns out that all the increase in global inequality is accounted for by the rise in the between component. In fact, the within component, which is the red, right? It's, it's more or less the same, okay? Within margin of, of sort of error. It looks like it has shrunk, but no. It, it's, it's pretty much uh, the same. It's the yellow part, the between country inequality that has that has, um, uh, that, has, that has increased, so that by today, right, if we look at total global inequality, roughly three quarters, between three quarters and four fifths of global inequality is accounted for by inequality across countries rather than by inequality within countries, okay? Which is just another way of saying that the right answer to the quiz was that you'd much rather be poor uh, in a rich country than rich in a, in, in a poor country, okay? Now, uh, so countries, it sort of makes sense looking at this because it's really what has happened at the level of countries that is accounting for this increase in, 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 in these disparities. So understanding what makes countries grow uh, is, is, is a big part of understanding what has happened to these global disparities. Now, I should say that, that since, you know, as economists, we get always sort of uh, accused of caring only about income, right? Uh, so we know about GDP, you can measure it, and if we calculate its growth rate and so forth. It's not just about income, although I will be talking mostly about disparities in income terms. Uh, if you look at the relationship between income and life expectancy at the level of individual countries, there is in fact a surprising strong correlation, uh, 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 which is that this basically it's, it's quite a log linear relationship between life expectancy in countries uh, and per capita GDP. What's interesting, you might notice here, this is, this is, these curves are drawn for three different time periods, and one of the interesting things you notice is how the curve has shifted out over time. And that's, of course, because of technology and improvements of public health, uh, that at the, same level of at the same level of income, now countries are able to obtain much higher levels of life expectancy because of secular changes in, 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 in the efficacy of public health problem, uh, uh, of, of programs. But nevertheless, there is a quite uh, significant relationship between income and life expectancy, and even with respect to life satisfaction. Now, it turns out that uh, 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 Golub um, has these sort of polls around the world and asks people about sort of you know, giving you a scale of from zero to 10, where zero is uh, my life is as bad as it could possibly be, uh, to 10, my life is as good as it can possibly be. Right? So it's a, it's a self-assessment of how satisfied you are with your life, and the relationship, surprisingly, is very strongly uh, log-linear, that the average life evaluation increases with average income. Um, so. Poor but happy, 
we're not, we don't, we're not quite sure. Uh, certainly poor and less satisfied, uh, and, and rich and, and more satisfied. Interestingly, the answers about with happiness tend to be a little bit different, but uh, there's a nice work by Angus Deaton, in fact, um, Dan Ka Kahneman uh, on, on, on that, uh, that uh, um, I'm happy to talk about later. So let me, uh, having sort of made the case for um, why we care about countries, why we care about their growth, why we care about uh, GDP, um, let me turn now to this question of um, sort of what is it that we know about growth rates and the patterns of convergence uh, around the world. So here I'm just going to now be a little bit more specific and concrete about what I mean by convergence, okay? So I'll be talking now about a specific meaning of convergence, uh, which is in the uh, economics literature is, 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 is called beta convergence, and because it's, it's effectively uh, comes from an equation like this, which is to say, let this be the growth rate of an individual country, so J uh, stands for a particular country, let YJ be the initial uh, GDP per capita or per worker of that country, and let Y star be the frontier level of productivity. So that's like the productivity level of countries like the United States or West Germany. So this is really the technological frontier, okay? Um, and beta is basically the rate at which uh, countries are going to be closing that frontier, the difference between where the frontier is and where they are, okay? And if beta is positive, then there is convergence because countries that are further away are actually will be growing uh, more rapidly uh, than those that are closer to the frontier. And, and this epsilon is just sort of some idiosyncratic uh, um, sort of noise in the data uh, that basically averages out to zero. So it doesn't uh, uh, exert uh, long-term secular effects. Now, what this implies, this is a very clear empirical implication, the notion of beta convergence, it was that if you just do a scatter plot of growth against initial levels of productivity or initial levels of income, then what you will get is, a, is basically a negative slope. And, that, and the slope is actually precisely minus beta here, okay? The, 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 um, the relationship between y hat and y is negative beta. So that's the implication. If there is actually convergence in this sense, you can do this simple test and figure out if, in fact, uh, you're getting convergence or not. And when you do that, you'd get nothing like what that theory predicts. Uh, in fact, uh, this slope is not even remotely negative. This is for a relatively long period of time, between uh, 1870 and, and to the present day, more or less. This is sort of more recent period. So you can do this all kinds of different ways. I'm just showing you two representative scatter plots uh, that, you know, so it's not that, you know, this, you know, this positive slope shouldn't be necessarily taken seriously in that it's not a statistically significant relationship, but, uh, but there's clearly uh, no indication in the, in the data that convergence um, has been historically there. And that shouldn't surprise you because I showed you that, you know, sort of the differences between countries have been exploding. So how can then we have had actually convergence? So this just is, is another way of looking at the same thing. So faced with these kinds of, with this kind of evidence, with the absence of convergence, uh, where has the economics profession gone? How does it make sense of this? Well, where it has gone is to say something like this. Well, we know that latecomers, that is poor countries, have access to all, in principle, to all kinds of benefits, right? Uh, they don't have to reinvent technology. Uh, they have access to a lot of capital that rich countries already have, rich countries savings, and they have access to global markets. So these are advantages that, you know, uh, today's rich countries didn't have at the time. So those are all reasons why, in fact, beta convergence should hold. Uh, but there are many other countervailing um, uh, reasons that create headwinds, and that's why a lot of countries, in fact, do not converge. What are those things? Well, those are, you know, the kinds of things that you're going to read, you know, you pick up when you pick up the New York Times about, you know, sort of the various syndromes and problems of developing countries, 
that they have you know, lousy policies, they have weak institutions, they might be stuck in parts of the world without access to uh, any sea routes or, or, or any, any transport routes. They might be having sort of stuck in poverty traps and all of, of that, which sort of has the implication that you know, the way that we should think about convergence is not in a con unconditional, um, simple way that I presented, but you should think of it in a conditional sense. That is that convergence happens only if these kinds of disadvantages are eliminated. So what our convergence equation becomes now is that we have a whole bunch of stuff, country specific stuff, these might be policies, institutions, country geographies, right, um, that affect uh, the prospects for growth and convergence and that you get convergence, this part becomes operative only to the extent that you control for these other things, only to the extent that these don't exert. This is really, this is where the, the, the current theory of economic growth and convergence is, and a lot of the um, discussion and debate and, 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 and research is really about trying to figure out what are these CIJs, what are these specific policies, institutions, um, and, and, and what are their respective impacts on growth. So it's all about discussing you know, is it poverty traps or is it weak institutions? Uh, if it's weak institutions, what is it and so forth? Now, this is where the literature really stands, but there is a very interesting wrinkle uh, in, in, in the story uh, which um, I, I want to talk about that, that makes this, uh, uh, that suggests that this isn't necessarily a very good way or at least a complete way of thinking about it, that there is a complementary perspective um, and that comes from, from, the, uh, from uh, disaggregating this convergence story. Remember I showed you these uh, scatter plots for convergence and these were at the level of individual countries. Each dot here uh, is a country, it is a country. Here is over this period, here it's in a particular decade. But each observation here is a country. Now suppose I did exactly the same thing but instead of looking at countries, I just took, for each one of these countries, I just extracted their manufacturing industries. Okay. And here are four representative scatter, scatter plots for, um, uh, for food and beverages, chemicals, machinery and equipment, motor vehicles. I could have done it for any number of two-digit products. Now, when you do that, exactly the same kind of exercise, Strangely enough, you're recovering beta convergence. Beta convergence is back there. It doesn't hold for countries as a whole, but it turns out that it holds for specific type of industries here in particular manufacturing industries. Now, how general and robust is this relationship? Well, it turns out that it's extremely general and extremely robust. So this is the chart on the left-hand side uh, is, the, uh, is basically every two-digit industry uh, for which we have data across all these countries. So this is that relationship. And this is the same where instead of looking at two digit, I look at aggregate manufacturing and again, very strong sort of negative slope. Uh, beta convergence is definitely there. It doesn't matter whether I do this for four digit or even more disaggregated instead of two. It doesn't matter if I do it for the 60s and 70s as opposed to the 80s and 90s. It doesn't matter if I do it for Africa instead of the world as a whole. This pattern of unconditional convergence in manufacturing industries is in the data, regardless of any part, any geographic um, or, 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 or sectoral disaggregation. And the beta that you estimate is actually very high, 2.9%, and highly significant statistically, which implies a half-life of convergence of about 40 to 50 years for low-income countries. So that means that if you're in one of those low income category, that you would have caught up uh, in about two generations. Or no, I'm sorry, you would have made 50% of the difference uh, in about uh, two generations. It's incredibly strong, incredibly rapid, very powerful. Now what does this mean? Well in terms of received theory, what that means is that sort of these uh, generic explanations for underdevelopment such as corruption, poor property rights, geography, poverty traps, cannot really be right or at least uh, need to be qualified. So why is it that if corruption is the issue, why is it that 
you know, manufacturing is actually getting all this strong convergence, uh, is, is actually, you know, apparently able to absorb all the technology, increase productivity, where in the rest of the economy isn't. Okay, so this is just sort of uh, puts a fly in the ointment, um, about in the in the in terms of, of, of our existing story. Um, but you might then ask, well, this only you know makes this, makes the puzzle a little, you know bigger. So why doesn't why don't you you know if you have such strong convergence effects in manufacturing, why are we still having some poor countries? Well, mechanically, the reason is that manufacturing industry is great, but it's small. Uh, that if you sort of alpha is a share of employment uh, in, uh, in, in manufacturing. In the typical developing country, or low income country, uh, the share of manufacturing in total employment is way below 10%. Okay? So what that means is that 10% can actually push the whole of the, the rest of the economy up. Uh, and uh, secondly, uh, that uh, industrialization in the sense of the manufacturing sector increasing and absorbing more and more of the economy's labor, uh, that takes place very slowly, typically, despite very large gaps that's implicit in the productivity of manufacturing and non-manufacturing, given that the manufacturing is this escalator part of the economy, is on this rapid convergence path, and the rest is stuck at much lower productivity. So what that means is that you need to think about these economies at the very least in dualistic terms, modern manufacturing part and a non-manufacturing, non-converging part. So what that means, again, just putting that uh, sort of together, uh, is that the overall sort of the convergence equation would look like the overall growth of the economy is made up of, of, of really uh, three components. Uh, one would be sort of the, the, the country-specific or idiosyncratic term. Um, a second term, which is the, man the specifically manufacturing convergence term. But, but now, note that is pre-multiplied, that's multiplied by alpha, the share of manufacturing in the total economy, and be precisely because that is so small, it doesn't actually exert strong impact on overall growth. And it turns out a big difference across countries is this last term, uh, which is the reallocation, or the structural change term. How successful different countries are in moving their labor from uh, non-manufacturing to manufacturing, industrialization. Okay? Now, when you look at it from that perspective, a lot of things start to make sense. It makes sense, for example, that when you look at all the rapidly growing countries in the world in the post-war period, that by far the most of them have been uh, either the rapid industrializers uh, in the European periphery, uh, or they have been the Asian manufacturing miracles. Very different time periods, very different geographies, but in all, both of those cases, what's been common has been that they have been very rapid industrializers. Or, just going back in history quite a bit, rather than asking the question about convergence, if you ask a question about why did we get the initial divergence? Right? Because countries, you know, back in 1700, before the Industrial Revolution, you know, the income levels be between uh, Western Europe and, and China wasn't that high. Uh, it, might, it was actually relatively small. The reason for that is, once again, that it wasn't just that the advanced countries industrialized, it's also that the developing countries here represented by China and India, remarkably, they actually deindustrialized. It's not that they lacked, they lagged behind the rest, it's that in per capita terms they were producing less and less manufacturing. So if you think about a country like India, which uh, at, in 1700, the British, were debating whether they should allow the East India Company to import cotton textiles from India into Britain. And they were fearing that if that happened, the craft manufacturers in Britain would go out of business because the Indians were so much more productive. By the end of the century, uh, in fact, um, the, uh, it was the other way around, that it was the um, text, cotton textile industries of India that were completely um, um, uh, overtaken by the, uh, by, by the, the British uh, industries. Uh, and you see what the, the, the decline of, of, of manufacturing there. Um, so how does this, um, what does it mean in terms of, of actually 
what countries can do for themselves. Um, I've talked a lot about the mechanics of convergence. I've talked about the role that industrialization uh, has played in this. Uh, but I haven't said anything about sort of why is it that some countries are able to rapidly industrialize and others aren't. Um, and here I've done my best to summarize everything I think I know about those differences in one slide. Uh, and I'm, I'm not going to get into the details of this unless there are sort of questions. Uh, but it's an interesting story. Uh, it's an interesting story that has elements of commonality with the usual understanding of what makes for economic development in the sense that you know, what we can call macro fundamentals have played a role and those are sort of reasonably stable fiscal and monetary policies, reasonably business, business friendly policy regimes. But I am, I, I'm italicizing reasonably because these aren't actually very demanding requirements. Uh, but equally important uh, has been uh, a set of pragmatic, opportunistic and often unorthodox policies that many of these successful countries, whether in Europe or in East Asia, have employed to artificially stimulate, artificially relative to the benchmark of less fair, artificially stimulate their manufacturing industries. And what's important and interesting there, of course, that these specific policies of industry support have varied greatly. The policies that China has used has been very different than the policies that, that Taiwan has used, very different from the policies that South Korea has used. Okay? Um, so there's a, there's a lot to be said here, uh, but I just wanted to sort of signal some of, to, of, of the things. So finally, because I'm, 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 I'm running uh, out of time, uh, I want to say just a few words about what this perspective on growth implies uh, about uh, you know, the prospects for, of convergence as we go forward. Remember, that was the, the question I started out with. And here there is bad news. Uh, the bad news uh, is that in terms of this process of industrialization, we're very unlikely to experience it in the future in the same way that we have it in the past. And the best way to see this is to look at historically the level of uh, industrialization um, at, the, at the point at which it peaked. So this is the peak manufacturing level that each of these countries experienced during their history. And so what's on the, um, on the hor horizontal axis is that alpha, the share of employment in manufacturing, and I've selected the year for which that share uh, became the maximum, where it re reached its peak level. What you can see is that the early industrializer, in fact, some of the continental industrializers put as much as 35% you know, or more of their labor force into manufacturing. The United States, uh, you know, maximum was about 27, 28%, okay? Most of the early industrializers, in fact, reached very significant levels of, of industrialization before they began to deindustrialize. Among today's emerging markets and developing countries, there's literally only one country that comes looking nearly uh, similar, and that's South Korea. Among the rest, even Mexico has basically has managed uh, to experience sort of barely about 20%. Um, India has peaked, if you can believe that, India is now deindustrializing, de a country that's extremely poor, but it's now deindustrializing. Its manufacturing employment share having peaked about 12, 13%. You might think about China as this sort of big sort of industrial powerhouse, and it is, because China has so many people in absolute numbers. But if you look at the share of employment, total employment in China that has been in manufacturing, turns out that's a number that's very hard to get. Uh, so I've been the most sort of, I've given China the highest number I've been able to figure out, which is about 17, 18%. Most numbers suggest that this was actually uh, lower. Chinese industrialization measured by the share of employment in GDP actually peaked in 1996 and has been coming down. Yeah. So what that means, of course, is that, that these countries are not going to be experiencing this rapid ongoing growth in quite the same way that the, uh, the earlier uh, wave of industrializers have, have happened. Growth is going to be running out of steam much sooner, and you have to worry about a whole lot of social and political consequences of this premature 
deindustrialization because many of the advanced industrial countries of today sort of built their entire social and political systems around an industrial working class. And what that meant in terms of disciplined political parties, what it meant in terms of the you know, creation of, of political democracy over time. What does it mean for the developing world if in fact they're never going to become as industrialized or even not even half as industrialized um, as, as the advanced countries uh, did throughout their history? So uh, for a whole host of, of, of reasons, I'm relatively pessimistic uh, about the, the, the future of convergence. I should say that, that uh, uh, convergence at the rate that we have experienced uh, in the last uh, two, two uh, decades, China is facing very important structural difficulties that we can talk about. I've mentioned the earlier onset of deindustrialization, and we're definitely going to be facing a much less benign environment for manufacturers' export-based growth strategies. I mentioned that China did a lot of what it could do because basically the advanced countries let China, you know, not to be sort of put too fine a point on, it's basically you know, steal technology, you know, play by, you know, sort of, um, uh, you know, a, a double set of rules and so forth, and that's much less likely going to be possible uh, for countries that want to emulate Chinese strategy going forward. So, um, so I end by saying, by concluding, that what we have seen uh, in the last uh, two decades uh, is, in fact, uh, a, a rather uh, a blip. Uh, that doesn't mean that we're not going to be experiencing convergence, but to the extent that we experience it, it's going to be at least as much due to the fact that the industrial countries are going to be doing, are going to be growing less rapidly than they have in the past. And uh, finally, uh, as the global environment becomes much less supportive and much less a driver of uh, convergence and rapid growth in the poor countries, what we're likely to see is now significant differentiation significant heterogeneity across countries in terms of who is going to be doing relatively poorly uh, and, and who's going to be doing really poorly, who's going to be doing relatively less poorly or who might be doing a little bit better. And um, what would those differences depend on? Um, that would be the topic of, of another lecture. <laughs> and maybe my next one would be on that. But thank you so much for, for listening.